gonna go ahead and move into our next presentation. And unfortunately, Christina Parter is not going to be able to be here with us today. She had a um, serious medical condition and um, recent diagnoses and has to start treatment on Monday and will not be with, here with us. However, she was very, very, very um, incredibly concerned in making sure that, that she Everybody knew that she wanted to be here, and so she has recorded comments on as part of her presentation. We'll hear those at the end of the presentation. So I'm really grateful to her for doing that, and also just want to lift her and her family in prayer as they um, are working through this medical condition. And so we are going to be joined by Alyssa Wexler, who is going to instead um, assist us in this, and she's going to be introducing the community advisory board members who are going to be doing this with her. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here this early in the morning uh, to listen to research. Um, so uh, today, my colleagues and I are going to be talking about the Growing Resilience Action Research Project. So a quick overview of the story that we're going to be sharing today. Uh, first, I'm going to share some information about the Growing Resilience Project. Um, I'm going to try to keep that pretty brief because we'd like to focus mainly on the overarching lessons learned and things that we gained from this research partnership. So after I introduce the project, I'm going to hand the mic over to our community advisory board chair and member um, Rhonda Bowers and Ina Weed Hurley. And, uh, and then after that, um, as Abigail said, we have some lessons learned uh, from Christine, uh, that Christine Porter has recorded for her slides. Um, and then after, we have a couple more of our advisory board members, Pat and Clarice Harris, who will be joining us for the panel discussion. Um, so my name is Alyssa Wexler. I am a non-native research scientist at the University of Wyoming, and I'm the project manager for Growing Resilience. Some background first on where the project uh, comes from. Uh, it started with a previous research project called Food Dignity, and that was a nationwide look at how uh, different local communities build and maintain sustainable food systems. So one part of that was um, giving mini grants to community members to do anything they wanted to develop uh, some part of their local food system. Um, so something that came out of that uh, at Wind River Reservation was uh, a design for more home gardens, specifically home gardens. And so after Food Dignity was over, the community was asking, how do we get more support? How do we get more funding for more, more home gardens? And uh, Christine Porter worked with Blue Mountain Associates, so that's Jim and Virginia Sutter, that's though they're on the left and right pictures there, um, to think about how we could turn this garden thing into a research question so that we could get funding for those gardens and then also be doing research about, uh, about those gardens. So the research question that they developed is what are the impacts of home gardens on family health in Wind River? So this, we were gonna take a two-prong approach on this. The first one was the gardening intervention itself. So that's overseen by Blue Mountain Associates to uh, develop the garden intervention and design, um, provide materials, help install the gardens, and do a bunch of training and mentorship. So that's all been overseen by Ethelene Potter, who's here in the audience with us today, our garden manager. Um, and then the second part of that is uh, the research side, which is a delayed intervention, randomized control trial on the health impacts of home gardens. So about as Western science as you get there. Um, uh, so what that means is that the participants get split into two groups. Uh, one gets gardens immediately, two years of gardening support. The second group is the delayed intervention control. They do health measures for two years before getting uh, the full two-year gardening support. So that wait was one of the hardest hardest things. Uh, but the research side of it was overseen by the University of Wyoming doing quantitative and qualitative uh, data collection. And then we also partnered with Tribal Health, so Eastern Shoshone Tribal Health, Northern Arapaho Tribal Health, and Wind River Development Fund to work on family recruitment and retention. Um, and also, sorry, I didn't say Blue Mountain Associates is a native-owned nonprofit. Uh, and then we also worked with Wyoming Health Fairs, which is a non-native nonprofit, and they uh, oversaw blood draws and sharing individual health reports uh, with each of the participants. 
So in our very narrow researcher perspective, we over saw this as being overseen by a community advisory board, and we had a pretty narrow scope for what we thought um, their role could be. Uh, and you know, we wanted to be able to refer to them on, on issues that we didn't understand in, in the community, um, but as Rhonda's going to talk about in a minute, we had a really narrow scope for what, what we saw their role could be. So uh, quickly, the project timeline, we started a pilot project in 2013 and we co-designed the project with community members, with tribal health, uh, with other people who would be involved. And then we applied for funding from the National Institute of Health, received that funding, and started our first recruitment round in the fall of 2015. We then had our first health data collection in February of 2016. <clears throat> and then it wasn't until April of 2016 that the first community advisory board meeting happened. And unfortunately, the community advisory board didn't end up being, <coughs> excuse me, didn't end up being the same group as what was in the project co-design, who ended up being more of our project partners later on. Um, and that caused a lot of confusion um, and uh, some other issues that Rhonda and Ina will also address. So, where we are now, um, we have 96 families, uh, which is 196 adults and 157 kids who have been <clears throat> participating in this project. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Um, and 63 home gardens have been installed so far uh, with more to come. Um, so really exciting. Uh, we've, we've had really good turnout for all of this so far. So next, I'm going to pass things off to Rhonda Bowers to talk about the Community Advisory Board. Good morning, I'm Rhonda Bowers and I'm the chair for the Community Advisory Board and I work for the University of Wyoming Extension Office and I am also the farmer, Farmer's Market Manager. Um, currently, our Community Advisory Board consists of me as the chair, Ina Weed, Pat Harris as the co-chair, Clarice Harris is our note taker, Pat White is a member, and Catherine Lonefight is another member. The board experience and our board experience is like agriculture extension, um, farmer markets. Um, we install the, the, some of our community advisory boards have installed the gardens. Um, being on this project, uh, participate, uh, being on this project is really fun. Um, the boards range from all ages, and we all do gardens. Um, the cab was brought on late due to unseen circumstances, and we should have been there when the pilot project was started so that we can, we know what the project was all about in the first place, and then picking the right members. And the university scope was just like from one year to the end. And then our vision for the community advisory board is from 2016 beyond so we can be sustainable in the future. Right now we, ha we are on all native advisory board. We had some conflicts in the beginning. Um, we restructured the board to ensure the community's outreach and making it sustainable beyond our project. We set our own uh, leadership structures and our roles. Um, we have more frequent meetings. We attend presentations and conferences like this one, and we went to the Montana one. Um, we have gained our own budget. Um, we have built the demonstration garden you can see in the picture, and then we set up. We we're going to set up our own farmers market in next year, and we have another one, another community garden coming up in Fotwashki next year, and then we have our. We're doing fundraisers for more funding. Um, in the pictures, this the demonstration garden, and then Pat and the other Pat are working on, it, on it this year. So, and design the weed. All right, good morning. My name is Ina Weed Hurley. I'm an Eastern Shoshone tribal member on the Wind River Indian Reservation. I am on the CAB um, since 2018, but I am a human resource um, manager, a staff development coordinator, and Eden alternative educator as well at Morningstar uh, Nursing Home in Fort Washkie. So 
um, I'm going to share my unexpected journey with you. All right, so unexpectedly, um, this pilot project came to us um, while I was working in um, the diabetes program with Eastern Shoreline Tribal Health Program. Um, I was a diabetes outreach worker. Um, so we already had a lot of that community involvement and um, my passion is just helping people. So I just love doing that, getting out there, talking, being involved with the community. Um, so it just made sense that this project came to the program in that way, um, just because we already had those networking relationships with families. But not only was it that, was because we only dealt with the individual that, say, was diagnosed with diabetes. But now we were going to get more involved with the family um, and it would, was each of the individual family members in the household. So it was huge, it was huge. So with that, um, it impacted um, their environment. So when we came in um, doing a pilot project, it was more of doing those screenings inside the home. So it was their environment, their space, and so we didn't have a controlled environment. We couldn't tell them to turn down their TV, their kids are playing in the corner, or trying to do a blood pressure. Um, so there were some challenges in that data collection. Um, but it was a pilot project. We learn. We live and learn. Um, so, and then there was one huge one where we did a, like a swab test, um, and that like tested for like the stress, cortisones, and everything. And so it was a lot of home, home visits there. And um, so me and my partner, we, we did all that. At the end of the week, we had to put them in a freezer so the University of Wyoming could come up and collect the data. Our two coworkers decided to clean out the fridge that day. And they threw them away. There was no way to go back and get that swab test again. So that part, and that's where some of the challenges. So we discussed and we we came up with a resolution of like, we need to find a different process. So and that's the count. <laughs> um, so through there, it was, I became a participant in the project. Um, so uh, this is my family. And um, so we, we just loved it. Um, it was very, um, I, I don't know, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to have a garden because look at this beautiful land in the picture. This is our backyard. Um, and so it's like, you know what? It only makes sense to have, have this. I mean, we're in health. Let's have these healthy options right in our backyard. And then plus we're able to get all these new recipes and try out this new food that my children um, just so love. They love being out in the garden. But with that, we were doing physical activity outside. We're getting out in that garden. We're watering it. We're getting vitamin D from the sun. Like it just heightened us as a family um, in our togetherness. That's what I love. Um, and plus it brought storytelling. We were making memories. Every time we went out, there was always something. Kids like having conversations, all these questions about all this stuff. Like it was huge. It was a huge impact for us as a family. So I was really grateful that we were able to participate in that. Um, in my role as a cab member. Um, so now I'm on a cab, and like I said, I've been on there since um, 2018. Um, so what I feel like I bring to the cab is I want to be able to bring some knowledge back um, from being in the pilot and as a participant. I'm giving that back to our community members, help find that sustainability for our community. Um, and just from what was told to me, what advice was given, what I listened to, like that, that I want to be able to give all back. Um, and then so, like I said, I presently work with some elders that um, um, in our nursing home, Morningstar um, Care Center in Fort Washakie. And what we do in my part as being an Eden alternative educator is helping build that human habitat for our elders. Um, and that's around animals, plants, children, because we want to be able to help them thrive in their lives. Just because they come to a nursing home doesn't mean that everything should stop for them. So we help that their journey continue of what they used to have. So a lot of them used to garden. A lot of them used to prepare their own food, probably cook meals for their families on holidays and birthdays and such. And so we want to 
be able to do that for them. So presently, that's where I'm at. So in the picture, you'll see some of our raised garden beds um, behind our home there, and then our elder and our care partner there. And those were freshly picked from the garden, um, but it's just huge for them, and they love it, because then they are sharing their recipes and telling us, like, we need to grow this because they want to cook so-and-so, <laughs> you know, meat and potatoes, things like that. So it's huge for them. But. Thank you. Hello. I am so sorry I can't be there, probably, mostly for myself. Um, but I'm pleased to be able to talk to you today about the gifts um, of learning uh, from the Community Advisory Board and other Indigenous partners in our work. You've probably seen these memes about equity versus equality, or even in one case here, reality. Abigail Echohawk has once offered us an alternative to this at this conference with a vision of a Native American woman walking into the mountains with her baby on her back, which for me depicts sovereignty in addition to equity. I recently read a blog that pointed out that the problems with this image, that it focuses too much on individuals and differences between individuals, including some people being literally smaller than others. And while that is important, it distracts attention from the thing we really should be focusing on, which is the fence. So I sketched this with the fence rising as representing that being the focus of what we should pay attention to, that those barriers to sovereignty and equity and health and well-being. And my colleague Alyssa pointed out that we could include historical trauma in this image, which here... I depict with literally kicking the boxes out from underneath people's feet. So what we really need to be thinking about perhaps is how academia and academics can be part of the fence and what we do about it. Alyssa and I have called this academia being part of the barriers academic supremacy, which we thought about when we analyzed how we spent our food dignity budget. And to do that just provisionally here with our $3.3 million growing resilience budget, you can see that over half the money goes to the University of Wyoming in the blue, plus Wyoming Health Fairs, who does the blood draws and sends us and the participants results. With the less than half the pie going to community partners, to the gardeners, um, and also for our national summit in 2020 that we'll be holding. And just to pick one thing out of this to look at, we'll look at this, that over $711,000 goes to University of Wyoming in indirect costs. And this is very common in federal grants to universities. And imagine if community-based organizations and tribal organizations had this level of investment in their work, like we get in our overhead just for keeping the lights on um, and paying for the research office and buying copier paper, things like that at the university. So these our institutions, our universities that are already so advantaged are further so by getting a much bigger piece of this pie. Whereas tribal partners or community partners generally at most can get 10% of over in overhead. So we need to dismantle the fence and one sort of nail prying strategies we have learned to use in our projects have included, most importantly, giving sub awards. Oh, a contract and a budget to tribal and community partners in our action and research, to negotiate with the university to pay in advance if needed to small organizations that can't afford to do the work being reimbursed. Obviously, increasing subaward support, making the subaward budgets larger, including to cover things that would normally be covered by indirect costs but are allowable for direct costs, like rent. Uh, faculty who are generally not paid in the summer can also forego summer pay uh, to increase the slice of the pie for others. We have done that. Investing in professional development and dissemination support uh, for community partners, especially travel budgets, uh, is key. We invest so much in that in universities, whether paying for graduate students or all of our conference travels, and we should do the same or more. Uh, for tribal and community partners, and that includes planning often that people will need cash advances, not just um, being paid back after the travel. 
And then there's questions way beyond these workarounds, like increasing indirect rates um, at the federal level that community partners get fighting for that. Um, tribal partners getting the awards instead of universities and fighting for more equitable pay and benefits. But in the face of our struggles, we have, and our mistakes, and my mistakes, I should say, um, we also are reclaiming sovereignty through the co-design of our work in this. For example, we did co-design this in a pilot. We created it as a randomized controlled trial and decided how everything should go. We learned so much in that process and made it such a better project from how to gather data to what kinds of survey questions are appropriate, um, which uh, data overall to gather. And especially, most importantly, piloting the gardens as the intervention. Gardens themselves are a way of investing in family sovereignty to grow their own food for themselves, for their families, for their neighbors, and choosing interventions in our work that have their own benefits aside and control and, and increase control for families and participants is key, like gardening. And of course, immensely important has been the leadership of the community advisory board. Uh, even though I messed up, um, I had a way too narrow idea of what they should do in terms of simply overseeing the project. Fortunately, we have a group of leaders that have seen the need to carry this well beyond the end of the project. And so we should have started this, I should have started this single community advisory board at the pilot phase to carry us all the way through. Um, but better late than never, and designing community advisory boards not only to oversee projects, but to carry the work forward well beyond the normal term of a grant is key. Fourth, our colleagues Melvin Arthur, who is here, and also Rachel Badoli, collaborated after listening very carefully to the community advisory board and to gardeners to create this method they call the sovereign storytelling method. Gardeners choose if and how they would like to tell their story, for example, as shown here through artwork. You can see maybe the glitter on the watermelon that's representing the dew that two young gardeners produced, or talking circles or videos or however people would like to tell their stories, we support them in doing that. And then the storytellers decide if and how they want to share their stories in a gallery, for example, or online or here at this conference. However, None of this is enough to achieve sovereignty and equity and health for sovereign nations and for all of us, for everybody. We have a very unhealthy nation overall. We need new paradigms. For example, this socio-ecological socio model for public health is the dominant one for public health, and it literally centers the individual. I don't think this is promoting health for anybody, and it's certainly not appropriate for sovereign nations. As Abigail Echohawk said at the very first one of these conferences, we need a new public health paradigm, an indigenous one. I feel that some of the most powerful things we could center in building a new paradigm would be the ethic of doing things in a good way, that those ethics would shape all of how we try to do research, generate new knowledge, and live our daily lives and also to center our relations, our relations with one another, with our environment, with other living things, and keeping those in our hearts and our minds as the foundations for how to build truly healthy nations and a healthy nation. I can only hope we have the wisdom to listen and do this. On the discussion panel, two more community advisory board members, Pat Harris and Clarice Harris, will be joining you along with Alyssa Wexler. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.